All right. How's everybody doing? Hey, I'm going to open up tonight with a super spiritual video. So please. No, that's not, it's not really. It's just a funny video. So pay attention. It'll be fun. Selfie time. These sorority sisters are apparently too busy taking selfies to watch the big baseball game. Do you have to make faces when you take selfies? Wait, one more now. Oh, yeah. Better angle. I'm oh, checking. Did that come out okay? That's the best one of the 300 pictures I've taken wait, myself wait. today. Every girl in the picture is locked into her phone. The sportscasters of the Arizona Diamondbacks game can't believe the Alpha Chi Omega sisters are more interested in selfies than watching the action on the field. Played off single here in the fourth, and nobody noticed. Help us, please, somebody help us. Yeah. Can we do an intervention? How about if we send Baxter out there and he just collects all the phones? <laughs> all right, so what's funny about that is that is actually real. It happened during a real baseball game. And if you saw the entire clip of the game, if you were actually literally watching the game, the announcers would continue to roast these girls pretty pretty harshly, unfortunately. But they, they for... For, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes, no joke, they just continue. They could care less about the baseball game. Anyway, question I have for you. You think, you think these girls are all friends? No? Well, I don't know. Maybe, maybe they are. Are they friends with each other? Are they friends with people they're posting selfies to? Are they friends with their phones? I mean, I'm confused. Can we do a redo of that? No, I'm kidding. You've probably seen a video similar to, like, similar to this, but I want to ask you a question. How many friends do you have? Like, not like go to a game and not care anything about anybody else but your phone kind of friends, but just friend friends, true friends, tr like true, true friends. True friendship, true Christian community is kind of what I want to talk about tonight. So what is Christian community? I know that's kind of strange. That's a little weird. Maybe you think of a, like, is it a, is it a neighborhood? Is it whatever? But Christian community, you're going to talk a little bit more about that in your small groups. But I want you to define that tonight. We're going to try to talk a little bit about what that is. So there may be confusing to you, but tonight I want to talk to you about true Christian community. This idea of doing life together, okay, you've heard that term, living in fellowship with one another, why it's so important for a follower of Christ to chase after community, and why I believe that we are better together. Somebody say better together. Yeah. Better together. We're better together than we are alone. Not just having friends on Facebook or followers on Instagram or Snapchat or whatever, but true, authentic friendships that result in God honoring community. So we've been saying for the past two weeks that God's people are about kingdom business and gospel witness. Okay? Kingdom business and gospel witness. So I don't want to say that same thing, and also that God wants us to do his business and be his witness, and we, he wants us to do that together. So we talked about God's people chasing after all of the right things. Last week we said that God's people are valued. Okay, so tonight we're going to simply say this. God's people are stronger together. Okay, say stronger together. Stronger together. Let's pray together. Father, we do come before you. Pray, Lord, that these, just these next few moments are God-honoring. Lord, that you would speak through me, that you would speak through your scripture. And that we would hear what you want our hearts to hear. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, i got a piece of yarn. I need four young ladies and three guys. Just because I have seven. Just happens to be. Okay, one, two, three, four. One, two, and three. Come on up. All right, real quick. Yep, one, two, three, four. Come on. All right, you guys take a piece of yarn. I think I have seven here, I think. Uh, we'll get to the rest in a minute. Here you go. Grab one of these and then kind of spread out. Here we go. Here we go. I got two more. Did I call two more people? Good. So you guys have um, what I think is probably a pretty easy deal. Spread out here. When I say one, two, three, they're going to help me count. I want you to take that piece of yarn and I want you to pull it so hard that it pops. Now, come on, come on over here so they can see it. Okay. So they're going to help you count and you guys are going to break the piece of yarn. That's easy, right? Just going to break it. Good. Okay. Let's count. One, two, three. Go. Who got it? 
Yours pop, yours pop, yours pop. I don't have $100 bills. Did y'all's pop? You got yours? You got yours? Okay, good. All right, take that with you. Give them a big hand. Have a seat for me. All right, I need six guys. Got to be strong. One, two, three, four, five, six. There we go. Girls are strong too. I know that. I wasn't implying that they weren't. I'm just saying these have to be strong guys because we do have some guys in here. No, I'm All right, so you guys grab um, two each, an end each. Grab a, grab a stack here. No, no, no. Just grab a whole stack. Y'all going to be on one end of each other. Grab a whole stack, two and two. Good. One on each end. Okay, we're going to count down again, and you guys are going to try to break that. Whoa, whoa, get where they can see it. There we go. Come on over here. All right, ready? Grab it. You can do two hands if you want to. I would grab it with two hands, but I'm going to try to break it. Okay, one, two, three. You guys are going to break this. And so it's two of you, so you should be able to. Yes, we have a few more pieces of yarn. Here we go. Ready? One, two, three. Come on. Pull harder. Come on. It's two of you. Break. It's just yarn. The, the kids here, just the middle schoolers just broke the one piece. Pull. Okay. All right, all right. All right. Put it back on stage. Do me a favor. Put it back on stage. Grab three each. Grab three each. We're going to try to do this. I gave the middle schoolers one. I'm going to let you guys have three each, and I'm going to see if you can break it. Ready? One, two, three. Go. Try to break it. Come on, guys. Pull. Give them some encouragement. They need encouragement. Okay, okay, okay. Stop, 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 stop. Did anybody break the three pieces? Do me a favor. Put two down and just have one. Surely, I mean, they did one, right? Who did one? Raise your hand. Very good. All right, ready? One. Ready? Go. Come on. Come on, man. They did it. When did it go? This is not like super yarn. I want you just to break the yarn. Just like the other kids did. What in the world? Okay, all right. Put it down. Put it down. Put it down. All right. Give these guys a big hand. Give them a big hand. All right, so what's interesting about this, there's yarn everywhere. Maybe it isn't yarn, maybe it was string, I don't know. Anyway, so what's interesting about this is that the, the first group that came up here had a little piece of this. You see how this kind of, this string, here in a minute, I'll tell you what, small group leaders, if you want to, come and grab enough for your small group and take it back and it'll be an object lesson, you can give them and remember this. So, but, but they had a little piece of it and it was all woven together. So there was actually seven of those little pieces in one piece of string. And so what my point is in this is that just like the yarn, we're stronger together than we are by ourselves. So when I gave them the big clump, they had you know probably 20 pieces in each of these, but then we went down to three, and then we went down to only one. But the deal with this one is there's actually about seven small little pieces woven together in one. And so we can break one piece. One piece is not super strong, but you put two and three together, or four or five or six or seven, or even like 20, and you couldn't break it at all. So our main scripture tonight is from Acts chapter 2. But before we get there, I want to read a passage that illustrates this even better than I could. It's from Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12. It says, and this is a passage that when I do weddings, I talk about this a lot too. But it says, verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall... One will lift up his fellow, but woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not, not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one, against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord, listen to that, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. So two are better than one. The message version of the Bible says this. It says a three-stranded rope isn't easily snapped. That's what we just saw. Right? A three-stranded rope isn't easily snapped. How much better is our multi-stranded rope that I just showed you? Okay, so you guys and girls that are part of a sports team, you kind of get this idea, right? 
I mean, I know some of the guys, baseball, football, basketball, things like that, but if, you're, if you are an all-state running back, you're not going to rush for 200 yards by yourself. You're just not, you're not going to do it. You need an offensive line. We're stronger together. How many of you guys know who LeBron James is? Maybe four of you. Oh, a bunch. Cool. So would LeBron James be able to win a world championship by himself? No. He's probably one of the best players in the world, but he can't do it by himself. He needs a super team like the Lakers are. <laughs> or, or, like, or like the Nets are doing with James Harden and KD and all those guys. Um, Golden State Warriors. Who, does anybody know Golden State Warriors? A couple of you? Okay, they had, they had a theme. They actually won a number of championships a few years ago. And they had a theme. Their slogan was, they gave it to like 50,000 people that came to their game. It said, strength in numbers. And it was talking about how good their team was collectively, but it was also talking about how the stands and all the fans were like helping them win because we're stronger together. So if you play an instrument, how many of you play an instrument? Okay. If you play an instrument, you may know that even though you may sound okay, or some of you may sound better than okay, when you play by yourself, you sound amazing when you play with a 20 member, 200 member marching band. Or when you join other members of the orchestra, you make beautiful music together. Does that make sense? Kind of, are you tracking with me here? The string, the string, the teams, the orchestra, all of that. Our culture says this, the world. It says do your own thing. Be your own boss. You do you. You don't need anybody else. We even have a reality TV show called Alone. How many of you have seen Alone? Nobody. Awesome. I won't even talk about it then. We'll just move on. No, it's actually a show that people go off by themselves and they try to survive. And it's really difficult because it's more mental than it is physical. But to be honest with you, because they're completely alone. But all throughout scripture, the Bible talks about the importance of community. And we see that God says being together is better than living life for yourself and living life by yourself. In fact, in the beginning, if we go way back to Genesis... After God had made each thing in the garden, he repeated a phrase over and over and over. He said, he would, he would create something and he said, it is good. And then he would say, it is good, it is good. But when Adam, excuse me, when he saw Adam's loneliness, when he saw his emptiness, God said, it is not good for man to be alone. God says, Adam needs a helper. He needs a friend, a partner, somebody to relate to, somebody to communicate with, somebody who, who kind of gets him. According to Genesis 2, Adam needed something more. He needed that community that I'm talking about tonight. Even the very beginning of time points to the fact that we need community and that we're stronger together. I hope you hear that tonight. We're stronger together. God's people are stronger together. There's a quote that says this. It's going to be open on your screen. It says that community you create impacts the legacy you leave. Think about that for just a second. The community you create around you with your friends, with your fellow believers, impacts future legacy that you leave. So I want to look now at the movement that started with early followers of Christ way back in the early church. We call it early church. It's described in Acts chapter 2. So that's kind of our main passage tonight. Acts chapter 2, we're going to look at verse 42 through 47. We see very clearly how this Christian community that was created actually left an incredible legacy. A legacy that is the very reason we're even gathered here tonight. That's why we're here. So let's look at it. Verse 42. Acts chapter 2. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. Verse 45. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together... And breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So that's a level of togetherness that few people know or even believe is possible today. In fact, that's a level of togetherness that would probably make a lot of us feel uncomfortable, honestly, if we ever really achieved it. Not because it isn't right, but because it's difficult to get there. It's hard to do. But let's think about what was going on back then, okay? So let's think about what was going on in Acts chapter 2, or Acts, in that early church. The Christian church was starting during a time when people were taken advantage of. 
Uh, they were overtaxed, they were overworked, they were persecuted, they were living under a burden of foreign rule at times. There wasn't enough food to go around, there weren't enough homes to house people, and there wasn't, just enough, there wasn't enough money even to get by. So the early church, part of their community, they practiced this community. Their picture of community went beyond anything that we have seen. They did more than just go to church once a week. They did more than just show up for a youth group on Wednesday night. They didn't just sit around in a little circle and drink coffee and share prayer requests. Okay, they did more than that. They realized what we've been saying all night long. They realized they were stronger together. They bore one another's burdens any way they could. What does that mean? It means if there was no place for a person to sleep at night, you could count on our follower of Jesus to give up his home. If there was no food for hungry kids, you could count on a follower of Jesus to offer the food to help feed the person. If there was no way to earn a living, you could count on a follower of Jesus to provide for your needs. So our world now, unfortunately, is a little bit different. Well, for most of it is. Uh, of it, of, of, it doesn't just happen for us like we want it to all the time. Things go wrong. Uh, stuff happens. There's a job loss. There's an illness. We're dealing with illness right now in our community. It's tough. There's divorce. There's some of you in this room that you, you, you're familiar with this. You're familiar with these things that are going on. But even here, even then, excuse me, here in America, we're not selling everything we have to give to other people. We just, it's kind of our normal thing. We just don't do it like they did it back then. We're not bending over backwards to make sure that people around us are being provided for. It just doesn't seem like our world. Something happened between the movement that began in the early church and the current church. And it seems like we're missing something. But here's the deal. What the first Christians really got, like what they kind of really got, what they understood was, was that above anything else, Christianity was relational. Okay, it was, that was their foundation. It was more than just praying the right prayer or just thinking the right things or just having the right answers. A lot of times we feel like we're okay if we have the right answers. But at its core, Christianity was about a connection with other people. It was relational. It was about connection with other people, connecting with people, helping other people. And this is something that the 21st century we seem to have lost sight of. So that the picture of the early church doesn't appear to have relevance to us now. We look then and we go, oh yeah, well they could do it then, but we, we just don't do that now. But the way the first century Christians lived then does translate to, to those of us sitting here now. How it translated in our world. These people lived not just for themselves, not just for God. They actually lived for each other as well. They got that people were more important than anything else. They wanted to be relational. They wanted to help out. They wanted to be in community. They got that the world saw who God was by the way they cared for not just the people in their church, so to speak, or their community group or their life group or their small group, but also for anybody in need. They cared for those people. And these believers, they did it all the time, too. They didn't just, you know, sometimes we do something and we want to pat on the back and, and we want to kind of, that's our one thing for the year. But these folks, they did it all the time. They talked, they shared, they laughed. They listened, they challenged, they helped. They spent time learning about each other, partnering with each other, becoming unified with each other. With each other, They lived in this idea of community. Do we do that? If not, why not? So here's the thing, and then we'll get to the next point. We know by now, I hope, that through kind of some of the illustration and through some of the talking, that we can agree that we're stronger together. Raise your hand. We're stronger together. We're stronger together. Good. When we hear about people caring about other people, it makes us feel good inside. We desire to be a part of it. We want to do it. But when it comes to actually doing it, to living our lives in relationship with other people, sometimes we fail. We fail. We, 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 we don't do it. Okay? We run the other way. We, we avoid it altogether. We'd rather have hundreds of followers on Instagram but not really have to get to know any of them, not be real with any of them, not be authentic with any of them. Why do we do this? Because community seems hard. It seems too hard, too tough. It costs too much. It takes too much time. It's messy. It's filled with drama, but it's so worth it. I got one more quick point tonight. And hopefully, by now, you believe doing life together is a good thing. 
and you believe that God's people, like we said earlier, are certainly stronger together than we are by ourselves. But I want to challenge you tonight, point number two, and this sounds kind of weird, but I'm, I, I'll, I'll, I'll explain, I hope. But number two, number one, we're stronger together. Number two is crash the future. Crash the future. What in the world is he talking about? You see, creating true, authentic community may be messy. I said that a minute ago. It may take time. It may involve having to put up with someone else's drama. It's still worth it. Because check this out. It's worth it because God said life is better with it. And it's not just worth it for you right now. Listen to this. This is what I'm talking about the future. It's not just worth it for you to live in community right now. Building solid community is worth it for others that come behind you. And that's tough to think about when you're in middle school and when you're in high school. Like, you know, legacy and like the whole future thing. I know that's kind of difficult sometimes. But if you think about it, building solid community now is worth it for others that come behind you. It's worth it for your future. It's worth it for the future of the next generation. So I want to go back to our Acts chapter 2 passage and look at that very last verse. It's actually verse, actually verse 47. And look at the legacy the early believers left. It says this. It says, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And he's still adding to that number today. He's still doing it. We're sitting here on a Wednesday night at Warren Baptist Grove Town at this thing we call a movement because of the great movement that happened so many years ago. Because of the community that was created over 2,000 years ago. I think that's an amazing legacy, that community helps create through Jesus Christ, obviously being that central person and foundation. I said this quote earlier, the community you create impacts the legacy you leave. So my question to some of you, to all of you, is what legacy will you leave? What will it look like because of what you do now? What will it look like 2,000 years ago? If we look back at the early church and we go, man, we're sitting here now because of that. What is somebody 100 years from now going to be doing because of us? Thousand years, two thousand years, who knows? What movement will you start? What movement of God can you be a part of continuing into the next generation? What kind of community are you creating now that will allow you to leave a great legacy in the future? So I'm going to give you another quote that you hear me say a lot. I don't know if you remember it. There may be one or two of you that do. But it simply says this. I love this phrase. It says, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. You guys remember I've said it a few times. Okay. But who you're surrounding yourself with now will change the course of your life for the future. You see, it worked both ways, really. Authentic Christianity, authentic Christian community, true friendship impacts positively your future and impacts positively your legacy. But the adverse is true as well, right? Being alone, living for yourself, by yourself, or hanging out with the wrong crowd negatively impacts your future as well. So some of you are wondering, well, what in the world does this have to do with crash the future? That is such a weird statement. I'm glad you asked. But before I get to that, I want to tell you one more quick story, and then we'll, we'll close up. So about a year ago, um, how many of you have ever had the cable guy come out to your house? You know, something happened. Half of you don't have cable, that's fine. You have the TV guy, the washing machine man, no, no. A dude, come to your house. So the cable guy, the Comcast guy, actually about a year ago was, was out at my house. And something was wrong with the box. I have no idea even what it was, but he was outside. So it was one of those outside things, you know, that's connected to your house. And so I'm looking at it and we're going through all this kind of stuff. And then I hear this sound, and I'll tell you where I'm going with it in a minute. Just hang on. But I hear this sound of like, fire trucks and i'm like no that's not fire trucks and it's like screaming I'm like no that's not screaming howling it's like this weird just crazy sound in my backyard my dogs are going crazy but after about two seconds i knew exactly what it was i want to play something to you to see if you know what it is let's play that clip Who knows what that is? Yes. <laughs> what? 
Coyotes or coyotes, yes. That is that is basically a band of coyotes. So I left this Comcast guy. This is a true story. So so he's working on the box, right, on the side of my house, and we hear this in my way back woods. They're not my woods, I don't own them, but they're behind my house, a couple hundred acres. So I get to enjoy the scenery. But they're way back there, and I hear this sound, and he looks up at me, and his eyes are like boom. And I'm like, so I go in and my youngest daughter, who's uh, 15 now, uh, this was a year ago. So I said, hey, Lily, go get the shotgun. And so she runs into the house, brings the shotgun to me, hands it to me. I put a, a round into it and, and fire one off into the woods. And so like, it doesn't hit anybody because like I said, there's like 300 acres behind my house. So nobody's back there. And I thought, fired it up into the air just to, 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 to make a big sound. And so this guy, is like, <laughs> what is going on? I'm going into this house and he's got a gun and he's firing guns into this crazy, like howling noise that's way out here. And the coyotes are still going crazy. And so I looked at him and first of all, I was like apologizing to him if he wasn't a gun guy. I'm like, hey dude, sorry, I just went and got a shotgun and you're like in my house, but that's what we do out here in the country. And because I gotta protect my little dogs and my goats and you know, chickens and all that kind of fun stuff. My goats just had babies, by the way. Total off story. I should have brought pictures. I'll show them to you next week. I promise. They're, they're super cute. I, I should bring one and like pass it around. Be like show and tell. Show and tell. Y'all go with that? No. So, okay. Stay with me. So Comcast guy, crazy coyotes. All this happens in like a two minute span. Guy that owns the house goes and gets a, a, a shotgun from his kid, <laughs> fires it into the woods. And he's like, what is going on? So I looked at him and I'm like, hey, dude. I said, do you know what that was? So some of you guessed it was coyotes, right? So I said, do you know what it was? And he's like, nope. <laughs> and I said, well, it is a band of coyotes. I said, well, a band of coyotes or a pack of coyotes, some people call them. It's not a good thing for me because I have the goats and dogs and chickens and all that kind of stuff. And, and hungry coyotes starting to howl could come and attack them. And that would not be cool. So why do I tell you this story? Well, I tell you this because this got me thinking about a group of animals I call them a band of coyotes. Some people say pack. I think it's, it could be both. You can look it up. But about how these groups of animals work together as a group or a team to accomplish a goal. So sometimes not a good goal if it's a big band of coyotes trying to come and get my chickens, right? No, that would not be cool. But they have this awesome animal community kind of thing. And so when I said band of coyotes, some of you are like, no, oh, it's a pack and blah, blah, blah. Well, I want to show you actually a, a list of some things that... Um, I looked it up, and here's some animal grouping names. And so there's a um, band of coyotes, pack of wolves, a swarm of bees, a colony of ants. A lot of these you know, right? You probably didn't think you knew, but you know. You're a school of fish, herd of cattle. Um, buzzards, a committee of buzzards. Did y'all know that that was what a group of buzzards is called? That's pretty cool. Um, flamingos, are you kidding me? It's called flamboyance. Really, that's awesome. Uh, a parliament of owls, a pride. You guys have heard that, right? Okay, so one of my favorite things, though, one of my favorite group designations is rhinos. And as I wrap this up, I'll, I'll eventually get to the, the point. You see, rhinos can run up to 30 miles an hour. Did you guys know that they were pretty fast? You know what a rhinoceros is, right? A rhino. Okay, they have the pointy thing on the nose or because they're like huge. They're like, a, they're like an elephant, but not with a thing. The, what's that? Trunk. You know, but with a pointy, you know, whatever that is. Anyway, they can run 30 miles an hour, which is pretty fast if you, can, if you consider how much they weigh. And they're big, they're hefty, right? They're actually faster than a squirrel, did you know that? Not as quick, not as agile, but faster. You can look it up, Google it, it's true. But there's one problem with this phenomenon. A rhinoceros, a rhino, can only see, check this out, can only see 30 feet in front of them. So they're not blind, they just can't see very far. You know how, 30, how, how far 30 feet is? It's like me to the pole. That pole. I mean, that's not, it's not, it's not far, right? Can you imagine something moving that fast, that large, in, in concert together, like if they're with their group, plowing ahead 30 miles an hour, pretty fast, with no idea what's at 31 feet? No idea. I mean, they're just going. They see 30, but they don't see 31. You would think that they would be far too timid to pick up that amount of steam. That their inability to see far enough ahead would paralyze them to immobility. 
But with that horn pointed the right way, rhinos run full steam ahead without apprehension, which leads us to their name. Have you guessed it? A rhino moving together at full speed is known as a crash. You got it. They're known as a crash. But here's what's cool. I mean, can't you see that? Like, yeah, crash. <laughs> they go 30 miles an hour and can't see a lick. And uh, they're, they're going to crash. Um, but they don't. But listen, so here, here's, a, here's a cool thing. Even when they're standing around the water hole, even when they're just kind of chilling, they're still called a crash. Why? Because of their potential. you got to love that, right? I think that's what we're supposed to be. And that's why I say crash the future. That's what happens when we live and we move in community with one another. When we agree with each other that God's people are stronger together. Our student ministry can become a crash. We can become an unstoppable force that literally, this is my point, literally crashes the future. Because of the community we recreate, because we're stronger together, we can leave an amazing future. An amazing legacy for that future. We don't have to pretend we know everything about the future. And who really cares if we can't see 31 feet? Because whatever's at 31 feet needs to care that we're on, our, on the move. That we're, that we're moving. And that we can literally crash the future. We need to move together as God's people and become the human version of the rhino crash. That's why I said crash the future. I know it was weird. I know it looked, took a little time to get there, but that's what we're talking about. We can become the human version of the rhino crash. Living in community can be messy. The future can be uncertain. We can't see what's going to happen all the time, just like the rhinos. But we need to move forward with confidence. We're not alone. We're stronger together. The movement that was started 2,000 years ago that we just looked at in Acts chapter 2 is still alive and well. And we need to join the adventure, moving forward with full force. So as I close, I'll say this last thing. There's a future to crash together. There's a legacy to leave. There's a community to create together. Even when we don't know all the answers and even when we don't know the next step, because of who God is and because of who he created us to be, we can move forward together. Why? Because God's people are stronger together. Cool? Let's pray together. Father, we love you and we thank you for loving us.